do this. Um, I'm going to get started. And then, and as people come, um, cause that's what happened the last couple of times people just came late. We'll just invite them in, but I don't want to hold anyone else up. So, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So today's format, um, you all know me, so I'm not going to introduce myself, <laughs> but, um, uh, today we'll just, um, it'll be very informal conversation. Claire's going to present around structured literacy and making a shift to structured literacy from balanced literacy. And um, during the presentation, she'll pause at certain parts and ask for questions. Of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in chat. I'll monitor that and we can share them at the end as well. Um, and we're recording today's session, so hopefully that's okay with everyone. I'm gonna um, introduce Claire and then she'll take it over from there. Yeah. So Claire works at the Connecticut State Education Resource Center as a consultant, where her main focus is on SLD and dyslexia. She's very proud to be trained in Orton Gillingham as a dyslexia practitioner. Recognizing the great need for more support during distance learning, Claire became a certified Google trainer and works to train educators on everything from creating interactive slides to teacher websites. She will soon receive her certification in courageous conversations about race as a practitioner through the Pacific Education Group. At CERC, Claire has collaborated on, collaborated on trainings ranging from virtual engagement strategies to assistive technology tools and accessible educational materials and everything in between. Before coming to CERC, Claire taught special education at the elementary and middle school levels for seven years. In her spare time, Claire is a doctoral student researching the intersectionality of race and specific learning disabilities in Connecticut. She holds a master's degree, hold on, my phone just kind of died, in instructional design and technology. So welcome, thank you so much, Claire. So excited to hear this presentation. Thank you, Lisa. All right, I'm going to, and thank you for that introduction. So, all mm -hmm. right, you all can see my screen, my first slide, yes? Okay. Yes. So I'm gonna go through. I was just telling Lisa that I am very new to having a second screen. So if I'm if I mess it up, I'll you know I know you'll be um, gracious and just give me a moment. Um, I'll skip the about me slide. Um, just a quick disclaimer. Yes, I do work for CERC, but this is not funded by CERC. This is um, something from my own time, um, and nothing here has been um, endorsed by by the agency or by CSD. Just wanted to make that clear. All right, so a lot of you have seen this braid many, many times. Um, it's called either the simple view of reading or the reading braid. I've seen it by other names as well. Um, basically what we're looking at here is, um, it was developed from the science of reading. It shows the two essential components of reading, um, the underlying skills that come together. And the model is, is called simple because it does show that skilled reading has only two factors. Those factors are fairly complex. Um, students need to be taught strategies to successfully develop those automatic skills of word recognition and strategic language comprehension. Um, I get really excited about this stuff. So I'm, um, if I forget to stop um, for questions, it's completely okay to interrupt me. There's, it's a small group. Um, it's also okay to just drop things in the chat. Just wanted to say that because I could talk about this for hours. All right, so there's our reading braid here. So our next question is really is what is structured literacy? So structured literacy is an approach to teaching reading that is based on the science of reading, okay? Um, it's explicit and emotionally sound. It's designed for students to be successful. So for example, um, and I'm gonna provide an example for each one. Um, explicit means that we don't ever assume that a student can generalize concepts until they show us that they can. Um, when I was training in Orton Gillingham, which is one, um, method of, of using structured literacy. Um, I had one student whom I taught blends to, so like DR, FR, you know, GL. Once she, once she understood that concept within a week, she was good to go. She didn't need me to explicitly teach her other blends. She just got it. She got ending blends, no problem. I had another student who needed explicit teaching of um, beginning blends and ending blends. And then when we added a blend like SPL as in splash, he needed that explicitly taught to him again. So we don't assume that we know what a student can and can't do unless we've taught it to them ourselves. Um, and it's emotionally sound because um, more than half of a structured literacy lesson is always review. It builds on success for the kids. So they start from the beginning. I've seen this before. I know how to do this. I can do it. 
Um, one of the things, my favorite part of Orton Gillingham really was, um, and this isn't specific to Orton Gillingham, but they, they, they emphasize it a lot, is having a student notebook. And I wish I had a copy of them, but they're with the students that I had. Um, our kids would um, have a binder with them. And every time we learned a new concept, whether it was a new phoneme or a digraph or a syllable type, whatever, they would help me create a chart, a mnemonic device, something, add it to their binder, right? And then they'd have it with them always when we were reading. And if they didn't remember something, just go back and look for it, right? And it shows that we are human beings who should treat each other with grace and it's okay if we don't remember something. Um, one of the things I tell to our Orton Gillingham participants is that, um, you know, you are not going to memorize all of these, you know, spelling rules and generalizations um, in one week, nor even in one year. And so I think it's very important that we show the kids, you know what, I don't remember why this word is spelled the way it is, what the rule is. Let's look it up together, right? So it's very emotionally sound that way. We don't assume our kids can do this or can generalize it because if they could, they wouldn't need this instruction. So going on, it's systematic and cumulative, right? So there's a very predictable format um, and being systematic, meaning that I'm not going to teach the phoneme um, PH as in phone first, because that's not a phoneme that gets used very often in our language. It makes a lot more sense for me to teach um, a phoneme such as SH, which is used very often, right? So we have a specific order that we recommend um, going from most often used to least often used, all right? Um, diagnostic and prescriptive. So we look at the students' miscues and, you know, cause we're taking notes as we go, kind of like a running record, similar to that. And we're analyzing their miscues. So um, if my student is struggling, uh, you know, I've already taught them all the, um, the bossy R letter, or the bossy R sounds or their R controlled, whatever you'd like to call them. But, you know, oh man, I'm noticing that they're struggling with the difference between ER and IR. I'm gonna teach that in the next review lesson. Right, or I may need to reteach it all together, but most of the time students just need a review. I'm gonna stop there. Are there any questions? Just wanted to kind of go over that and why I love structured literacy so much. Um, this is not something, you know, going back to, to um, the original Facebook group, this is not something I was taught in college. I did take the foundations of reading. Um, I graduated college in 2012, so not that long ago. Um, but this is not some, these are not things that I was taught. And so I think it's really great to kind of see examples of it. Claire, I do have a question. Um, just curious about how you found this because I, I also wasn't taught this and I always mm -hmm. am curious how people came to structured literacy when that wasn't what we were taught. It was a complete accident, Sarah. Um, I taught in Southington for one year and I had a student um, who needed this kind of instruction or in Gillingham. And so I was informally trained in it by the, um, the literacy director there. And then the following year when I was hired in East Hartford on the fourth day of my employment there, my special ed supervisor came to me and said, um, we were going to send your colleague to the Orton Gillingham certification training, but she's not able to go. Will you go in her place? And I said, heck yes, I will, like sign me up, absolutely. And it was a lot to be a first year teacher and to be going through, you know, hundred hours of practicum and 50 hours, but I am forever grateful for that experience. That is awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. That was excellent. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what kind of teacher I would be like now if I hadn't had that, so. Um, so this is uh, the components of structured literacy. All right, so I'm gonna provide a brief example for each one. So phonology, right? English is made up of sounds, but it's made up of specific sounds, right? You know, we have t, k, right? We don't, we don't say the to each other, <laughs> that has no meaning, unless you're a teenager and you're bothering your sibling. Um, phonemic awareness is under that category, manipulating those sounds. So having phonological awareness means that you understand that English is made up of specific sounds. There are 44 sounds um, or phonemes, I should say, in our language. Um, I'll go to number two, uh, syntax. So that's grammar, mechanics, and sentence structure, right? Understanding that. Um, I don't know why my numbers went out that way. Sorry, guys. Uh, morphology. So morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning. So for example, it can mean affix or a root word. So saying, um, my brother destroyed my Lego tower, that ED at the end is a morpheme because it explains to me that it happened in the past right? Um, 
semantics. What does the text actually mean? What are we, what are we talking about here, right? Um, syllables, there are six, sometimes seven syllables. It really depends on who you talk to. <laughs> uh, knowing them helps decoding with decoding and encoding um, because otherwise it sounds very strange if you put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> so with, uh, and with our students, like I think of the word um, tiger, right? I'm splitting the syllable at the end of the, or excuse me, at the end of the open syllable I, tiger, otherwise it would be tigger, right? Because I would split it after the G. So that's how we teach our students to know which is which. It also, um, syllabication also um, uh, includes things like knowing, like I had said, where to put the em emphasis on the syllable. And then letter sound correspondence. Um, English letters do have specific sounds associated with them. That's the, uh, also called the alphabetic principle. Um, it's the same thing. And again, yes, do these uh, sounds change depending on where the letter is in the word or where the, where the, language, um, the language of origin is or um, what other letters are around it? Absolutely. Um, but if you talk to Wharton Gillingham trainers, um, they will tell you that over, I believe it's 85% of our language is decodable. I have a quick question. Go for um, it. So on the syllabication and teaching the syllables and marking them up and that, you know, I totally am, I totally agree with that. However, there is some discussion around and some research around set for variability and flexing the vowels mm -hmm. in place of using syllabication. So what are your thoughts on that? I like them both. I have seen yeah. both of them be successful with different types of students. I think it depends on um, the ability level of the student, the cognitive levels of the student, the, the frustration level of the student, because some students enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. I used to call it doing surgery on this. I, I, I literally, and this was well before COVID, um, I used to have the kids put on like surgical masks and gloves and they would cut the words up and you know, yeah. they, they had a lot of fun with that. That was third grade. So, this, so th some of them loved it and some of them hated it. So right. to be very honest, um, I think it's very dependent on the student okay. and, the, and their, their ability level there. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. So um, can I, so I've thought about this a lot too because I do teach syllable types and you know a lot of kids really, um, really understand it. And so if you're teaching, like if you are going to split after the vowel, mm -hmm. so VC split or V split C, that's kind of the same thing as flexing the vowel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, 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 you know, it's ahead. really two, it's, it's two different ways of talking about kind the of same thing. Doing, doing the mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah. 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 They just, the, yeah. The, conversation is that we shouldn't be teaching so much about the rigidity of the syllabication because sometimes it does it doesn't always hold true for every single word absolutely like if you look at the word record versus the word record mm -hmm. right it's the same word but it's pronounced right. differently because one of them is a noun and one of them is a verb Correct. and it, de it depends on how in depth you want to get in this and I know that teachers don't have a ton of free time you know to right. teach whatever they would please so um <laughs> I think that word study is a lot of fun. Um, I know that not everybody agrees with me, including students. And so I think that if they understand the basic types of syllables, those six or seven types, and that they understand the concept of how we can change um, the pronunciation of a word with syllabication, I think that's the bare, the bare minimum of what they need to know. But I agree with you, Sean, I don't know that necessarily that they need to know all of it. Um, I'd be interested if anybody knows of research you know, that has been where they've studied one way or another, um, I'd be really interested in seeing that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I also teach middle school. So, you yeah, know, I talking too. about record versus record, like we would go into that because it's part of speech and that's always part of our lesson. So, um, you know, I also, I think like you were talking about ability level and age, um, what other concepts you're trying to weave into the lesson. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so this is um, the ladder of reading. This is from Nancy Young's um, research. It was updated last year. So you are all fairly used to seeing the SRBI or MTSS triangle. Um, it shows that around 80 to 90% of our students benefit from tier one, 15, five to 15% benefit from tier two, one to 5% 
benefit from tier three, right? Nancy Young's research has shown us that this ladder better articulates what tier one instructions should look like. So remember that hundreds of analyses have shown us that 15 to 20% of our general population has dyslexia. Not 15 to 20% of students with special needs, 15 to 20% of the general population, right? So even if our students' needs never overlapped, which we know they do, we also have a significant number of students in Connecticut who are English learners. We have a significant number of students who benefit from that explicit multi-sensory multi instruction. That's exactly what structured literacy is. So I want you to take a moment and really look at this, this um, ladder. Now, I was one of those um, students for whom 5%, you know, I, my reading was, was basically effortless, right? But I know that, I know now that that's really not true, or, or excuse me, that's not, not true, that's not uh, common, right? It's just not something that happens naturally with most, with most students. So think, so take a look at this, um, this graphic, and I want you to really think about, you know, what does my classroom look like, or what did it look like last year, and how many students would be met by would be met with structured literacy. We always say structured literacy is essential for some, but it's truly beneficial for all. It truly, truly is. Just a comment that I'm something I'm wondering about: the 35% where learning to eat is read is relatively easy. Um, I would put my daughter, who's going into fifth grade in that category, but her spelling is abysmal mm. and she struggles when writing because of that. And, sure. I, and I wonder sometimes, no, I don't wonder, I know, <laughs> I think I know that had she had a structured literacy approach that this probably wouldn't be the case because she's obviously bright enough that she was able to learn to read with just some balanced literacy instruction. So even though we say it's relatively easy, I think there are other implications for that 35%. I completely agree with you, Sarah, because learning to read can be, if, 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 if it, I mean, I, I've never met your daughter, but learning to read can tend to be easier than learning to spell. Because when we spell, for example, long E can be represented by, I think, six sounds, seven sounds, or, or six or seven spellings, I meant to say, right? And sometimes there isn't a great rule about which one to use, right? So. Um, for students like that, I still think structured literacy would be, would be very beneficial because it's explicit, it's, ex, it's systematic, it, it teaches that alphabetic principle. So that's why we say everyone can benefit from structured literacy. Yeah, and I think that that's an important piece that for big proponents of balanced literacy to realize that it's reading is also so connected and you all know this to spelling and to writing. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely it is. So this is, um, and if you're in the, you know, the Science of Reading Facebook group, you've already seen this quote, but I was blown away when I saw this, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll read it out loud. For the most part, we expect children will learn to read typically until we see clear evidence that they might not. What if we flip that around? What if we expected children would struggle to read until we saw clear evidence to the contrary? Think of the swim test at the public pool. The lifeguards assume everyone is going to drown and no one should go in the deep end until you can prove you can swim well enough. They don't assume everyone is a swimmer. They assume everyone is a non-swimmer. Because what I tend to see in balanced literacy, and it's a nice idea, is that if children are taught to love to read, then they will know how to read. And those are two different things. There are lots and lots of kids who absolutely love hearing a great book and love being read to. That's not the same thing as being able to read those books independently for themselves and access that text themselves, right? So that is something that I think is very important. It is not, learning to read neurologically is not a natural process, right? I want you guys to think about that for a minute. There is no such thing as the reading or writing center of the brain. Whenever we are doing this, we are asking our brain to look at pretty arbitrary visual symbols that may look different depending on someone's font, someone's handwriting, the color of, of the, the font, things like that. And we're asking the brain to make meaning with that. And it's very challenging because that's not how we were designed as human beings. We haven't been reading and writing long enough as, as a species in order to have developed that kind of, um, you know, there, like I said, there's nothing up here. You know, there's, there's not one piece of my brain that lights up when I read or when I write, it's multiple pieces. And so that's why I say learning to read is not natural. 
it's a lot of fun, but it's not natural. So um, this up here, this is a link and I will provide Lisa with a PDF of this presentation after so that you'll be able to click on these links and take a look for yourself. So as a reminder, um, one of CSDE's largest initiatives for next school year and beyond is implementing universal design for learning. That's something that my colleagues, Mina Vora and I train on quite frequently. Um, this message can be found through many of their guidance documents, such as um, Adapt, Achieve, Advance, Achieve, that was updated in September 2020, and Reimagining Connecticut Classrooms, which was released in June 2020. All right, so again, UDL promotes emotionally sound instruction, right? They have multiple means of engagement, representation, and expression, which is the same thing as providing a multi-sensory experience in structured literacy. They're very, very much aligned. The level of challenge is right at the student's level, right? It should be challenging, it should not be frustrating. It honors student differences. And this is going back to um, what I was talking about before. It, we don't make assumptions about a student's vocabulary or their background knowledge, okay, in structured literacy. Because one of the things that I see with balanced literacy, that three queuing system, right? So I see a picture of a boat riding on the waves, the word is yacht, a student may not know that word yacht, right? It's all, it also doesn't follow the, um, the phonics rules. That's another, that's another story, but a student isn't going to know that, that word if they've never heard of a yacht. And if they look at that Y and they're encouraged to look at that letter Y and guess what word that is, they're gonna have a hard time because they're gonna think of themselves, well, I know what that is. That's a boat or a sailboat, but I don't know any other words that, that could represent that concept. I don't know about you guys. I don't have any yachts lying around, I, you know. So now here comes the big question is what about reading comprehension? Because that's the question I hear all the time. I think that there is a common misconception by opponents of structured literacy that the approach focuses too much on phonics. That's what I see. That means they're looking at only one piece of the reading braid because balanced literacy does not tend to teach phonics or related skills adequately or appropriately. And switching to teaching with evidence-based practices can sometimes look at, look, looks like it's too much right? Oh no, that's too much phonics. They don't need that. Okay. Um, and again, but structured literacy teaches that we teach students what they don't know. We don't need to, you know, for our students that truly don't need phonics instruction, we don't provide that to them. It's as simple as that. I am going to go through reading comprehension at length. All right. So this week, boys and girls, we're going to learn about cause and effect. Okay. This is what we're gonna read about each day to practice the strategy. You guys see that? We're gonna read about dolphins on Monday and the nervous system and recycling and then flamenco dancing and then cooking. And in each one, we're gonna be practicing that cause and effect skill, okay? So each text within a set of curricular materials is often completely different from the next one. Founders and Pinnell they, does that, Level Literacy does that, Reading A to Z does that, Reading Plus, I've taught with all of those, they all do that. The topics might be more aligned, they might be less specific in middle and high school because teachers tend to spend longer on a text than in elementary school. But if a student doesn't have background knowledge on all five of these things, they're need, going to need to be taught about those things before they can practice the strategy of determining what is the cause and effect in each text. So structured literacy teaches that we should be teaching concepts and not strategies. Now this is a little bit of an interesting twist here, I'll, I'll go much more into this in a moment. So I have a challenge for someone. Can you find the main idea and key details? This is an abstract from a text about accurate prediction of protein structures and interactions using a three-track neural network. I'll give you a moment to skim over the text and when you're ready, you can unmute and tell me. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we've talked about Finding the main idea is finding what the paragraph is mostly about, right? And those supporting details or those key details, they kind of help build, build up the main idea. They kind of help me relate back to that. So let me know when you've got it, okay? All right, I won't torture you guys for much longer. As my sister would say, I understand those words individually, but not really together, right? My sister says that a lot. I don't actually know what crystallography is. <laughs> but this is kind of, I'm trying to illustrate my point here, right? If a student doesn't have the background knowledge that is required for reading that text, then it doesn't matter whether or not they can decode that text, they're going to struggle comprehending it. 
So this is how we make reading comprehension stick. The best way to boost students' reading comprehension is to expand their knowledge and vocabulary by teaching them history, science, literature, the arts, using curricula that guide kids through a logical sequence from one year to the next. That approach enables children to make sense of what they're learning and the repetition of concepts and vocabulary in different contexts makes it much more likely that they'll retain information. Not to mention that learning content such as this can be a lot more engaging for both students and teachers than that endless practice of illusory skills. I'm gonna stop here and see if there's any questions or comments. I haven't been watching the chat, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So the question is, is what are the things should I be doing for reading comprehension? So let's go back and think about other parts of that reading grade that we need in order to develop a skilled reader. What are the parts of speech that make up this sentence and how are they working together? Let's be precise with vocabulary. What are the affixes of this word? How do they change the meaning? What's the relationship between a word with this root and others? For example, if your student knows the word view and they know the prefix pre, they can use morphology skills to figure out that a preview is like viewing something before, like a preview in a movie theater, right? Previewing, let's be precise, means it's happening now. Previewed means it already happened. And with structured literacy, it's very important to be precise. Okay, so we teach students to be morphology detectives really and think about what parts do they know. So did you know this, that there is no evidence that giving students individually leveled texts increases their reading comprehension skills, only their decoding skills. And I'm gonna talk about that more in a minute. So Shanahan suggests that students who are learn, that's, excuse me, that students learn reading comprehension better from texts that are slightly too difficult for them because these are the texts they tend to see on standardized assessments. And this makes sense to me because when I'm focused on decoding, I can't also be focused on reading comprehension. When I'm focused on reading comprehension, I shouldn't also be focused on decoding, it's too much. So for students that don't require decoding instruction, you know they're in grades three plus or they're reading at or above grade level already, Shanahan, Shanahan recommends challenging them with harder texts. If they do require decoding instruction, he recommends sticking with decodable books for independent reading. For reading comprehension or listening comprehension, they should be provided with those opportunities, eBooks, audiobooks, read alouds, and so on. Stop me if that does not make sense. Shannon actually recommended decodable books for independent reading. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. What do you what do you think about that? <laughs> Only because I just saw a recent tweet, Twitter thread that where he was like arguing with people who are recommending decodable texts. <laughs> oh, interesting. I wonder. Yeah. I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if it was the same person. I, I at the end it, I know it references. could be. Yeah. Um, no, you know, people do change their minds. Um, but this mm -hmm. is on his own website. Yeah, that's awesome. Great, thank you. Yeah, I saw that as well, and I think mm -hmm. what he was saying is that there isn't any research study or evidence showing gains with decodable text? For yeah. reading comprehension? For well, even with phonics. For, even with phonics. But I, I think that's because there aren't any studies that have been done. I agree. Not mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't work. Not because it doesn't work, yeah. Yeah, but for me, it makes sense that if I'm focused on decoding a text, right, then I can't also be, it, it's much, gonna be much more challenging for me at the end to be asked, you know, complex questions um, yes. and then vice versa. So that's why I really strongly totally advocate agree. the use of read alouds, eBooks, audiobooks, things where it may be too challenging for them to read um, on a decodable level, but these are the kind of books that they see on those standardized assessments. Yeah. Um, I did provide Shanahan's reference at the end. So if that's something you're interested in reading about more, you'll be able to dive into that. Perfect. And I recognize there's some controversy here. I, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm definitively, you know. Yeah, no, this is great. Thank you. So one caveat I want to add for teachers that are still teaching balanced literacy in their classrooms, because I've been there. Um, avoid overwhelming yourself and the students. If you're teaching eight different prefixes at once, that is not going to be helpful. So instead, if you're learning about recycling, teach the prefix re and talk about what it means to recycle, reuse, reduce, right? So one of these things, and I believe, Lisa, you've got a talk on this coming up, right? Um, a sound wall rather mm -hmm. than a word wall. 
Yes. Yep. Yeah. That's coming so I'm really up excited on for that one. August 10th. Yep. Awesome. Um, teaching word families for spelling works their way has a nice um, curriculum for that modeling decoding and encoding strategies out loud while you read and write explicitly teaching that morphology with your grade level vocabulary do blending drills and I have my my blending cards here which I'll do in a minute. You can have fun with it, you can challenge students to find examples of specific phonemes affixes root words other concepts in their books or even around uh, you know posters around the school. I had fun I had one I had my students challenge all the adults he ran into, they had to tell him what a schwa was. And if they couldn't tell him, he got a sticker. Phonemic awareness. That is phonological and phonemic awareness are considered the most critical components of reading success. So here are some very quick examples. Um, we can infuse phonemic awareness activities into our transition times, morning and after routines. We can greet students in the morning. Hey, today's the month of April. How many syllables are in April? That's all it takes, right? Um, I did put that text there and I, I can't find mine, but I know I have a copy. Sandra Dona's Improving Phonemic Awareness is a great resource. She has several hundred pre-scripted lessons with zero prep. You can put them up on your smart board or just you know in a small group um, and they're fantastic and they work with many different um, ages and ability levels because you can take different sections that you do want to do and ones that you don't, it's fantastic. You can make a classroom size version of those L, L Conan boxes on your whiteboard, right? Or your smart board and have the kids, you know, move, um, move, the, move the circles up on the smart board or you could have a magnetic board sitting by your door with, with magnetic pieces. You could do lots of different things with that. So I wanted to look at a typical fourth grade schedule because I taught fourth grade with special education for a while. So remember, make sure we need, we do need to explicitly teach phonemic awareness skills. We need to have students understand those skills such as blending and segmenting phonemes, right? So if Theo doesn't know how to segment the sounds in his name, then he's gonna have a really hard time answering that question, right? What's the last sound in your name? And that's fine. So we need to make sure that we're explicitly instructing that. And that's why I do like Sandra Dona's book so much um, because it makes, it, it has us teach those, um, concepts explicitly in a, in a sequential and logical sequence, okay? I see Liana's wearing a red shirt. Can you take out the eh in red, replace it with a? Uh? Okay, now blend it together, right? It can be really quick, really quick. Here's our literacy block, right? Literacy block, obviously the most, the, the most obvious time to teach these things, but we can have quick blending drills, right? Um, right here. Blend, or not blend, but you know, tell me the sound, tell me the sound, tell me the sound, right? Um, explicit teaching of those sight words, right? Teaching handwriting, and I do have lots of great resources at the end for those. Explicit teaching of reading comprehension that's focused on concepts and not skills. Let's plan for texts that help us build on what our students already know so that they can focus on growing their listening and reading comprehension. So talk to the specials teachers, what are they teaching? And what, should you, and what text can you find that support that information? I am a very strong proponent of this. Reading is reading is reading. So if your student is listening to a book, if your student is reading a book with a friend, if your student is reading a magazine or a recipe book, I don't care. Reading is reading is reading. That's what I, I firmly believe that. And our writing block, Write to the Beat, is an awesome resource. That link is in there. Um, it's by Marilyn, I don't know if I'm saying her last name correctly, Zecher or Zecher, I'm not sure. Um, she is an Orton Gillingham trained person and she basically wrote Orton Gillingham for math. Um, she, again, you wanna focus on one or two skills at a time, whether you're teaching an individual student or a small group or a whole group instruction. For example, if you teach second grade in a few weeks, you might wanna only focus on correcting capitalization in your students' written work. That might be the only thing we focus on. Fun way to teach multi-sensory punctuation could be read aloud a text, your students can see it on the board. Okay, every comma means you need to take a breath. <gasps> Periods, put your hands out, stop, right? Exclamation points, let's jump up and down, question marks, woo, right? Quotation marks, use your hands, talk, 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 talk. So Marilyn um, Zucker, like I said, the, the Right to the Beat program is phenomenal. Um, I believe you can get training for it. Um, but that link is a link to a free resource that she published. And so I do encourage you to take a look. Um, I think I put a link at the end. She has a, um, 
a webinar that she did that's available on YouTube. And I think I put a link there. She is phenomenal. Lunch and recess, right? Let's use those transition periods to practice phonemic awareness as we're walking down the hall, okay? Um, let's specifically plan to teach, practice those skills. So before you can line up for lunch, I'm gonna show you a card and tell me a word with this phoneme, or tell me, um, oh, that was a wrong example. Tell me a word with the phoneme j in it, right? Or tell me the rule if you want to as well. Tell me the spelling rule for when you use G-E versus D-E, D-G-E, sorry. Um, anything you want. And, and it really only takes a few moments, but just having those quick blending drills with the whole group, I think can be really powerful. Math, great time to explicitly teach that math vocabulary, right? Triangle, what does that mean? It doesn't actually, the word triangle does not mean three sides, does it? It means three angles, right? Polygon, poly means multiple sides. Let's be really precise with our vocabulary. Let's teach them exactly what those words mean. Sequencing in math, same thing as sequencing in reading, right? Words go, or excuse me, numbers go in a specific order. So do the events of a story, right? Let's show our work in math. It's the same thing as supporting our argument in reading. Reading comprehension is necessary for math word problems, right? What, what information is being given here? And then what do you still need to know? Count to 20, let's smack the table whenever we hit a multiple of five, let's make it multi-sensory, right? So she, this is the lecture I was talking about. Um, this is for um, the switch from arithmetic to algebra, which is typically fifth to sixth grade and, and beyond. That's a fantastic lecture. I watched it um, a couple of days ago. I learned a lot. Um, I did used to co-teach algebra as an eighth grade special education teacher. Um, and I really wish I'd had this information when I taught there. And then those specials, I know sometimes teachers, you have specials and of course you don't usually tend the specials with your students, but you may have a content area subject instead, right? What are the musical connections that we can make? Whole note, half note, quarter note. Rotate your body 180 degrees, arms up, show me an obtuse angle. Teach proportions, fractions, and art in foreign language. Let's show morphological similarities. In content area subjects, let's make sure using those UDL checkpoints, and this is something that CERC can train your district on for free, um, allowing for multiple means of engagement represent, uh, excuse me, that should say representation, that's a typo, um, and expression. Understanding how authors use those graphics and captions and pictures to illustrate their points and tell a story. Sequencing in reading, it's the same thing as sequencing social studies timelines, right? Science processes and systems. When a flower seed is planted in the ground, it has to go through a specific process before it becomes a flower, right? Same thing as the story has to be told in the right way or it won't make sense. You can do lots of virtual tours of historical sites, museums. Those are very multi-sensory um, experiences for science and social studies. And those are things you can do whether you're teaching virtually or not. I am more than happy to provide information on that, but Google um, thousands and thousands of museums and other um, both art museums, science museums, history museums around the world offer lots and lots of free virtual tours for students at many different grade levels. And those are a lot of fun. I did them because quarantine and I was bored. <laughs> All right, remember, science structured literacy, it's systematic. It is cumulative, it builds upon itself. It is explicit. We assume everybody needs that instruction until our data shows that we don't. It is diagnostic. We look at their, anal at, we, excuse me, we analyze student errors using frequent progress monitoring and we prescribe it. We work on multiple opportunities to practice concepts that students made errors on. Any thoughts, questions, comments here? Okay. Here are some tips that I have for a dyslexia friendly classroom. And because um, we have some time, I am gonna show you guys the UDL guidelines because like I said, my colleagues Smita Vora and I will train on um, assistive technology, education, uh, accessible education materials or UDL for free to any public school district or public school. Um, so what we're looking at here is, um, these are some things that are essential for some, right? Beneficial for all. I feel like I should get that tattooed on my forehead because it can be, I, I say it so often. We can put our analog clocks and our digital, digital clocks side by side. 
I know most of you, if not all of you, provide graphic organizers for your students, right? But what are different ways students can show their knowledge on the subject, provide access to ebooks and audiobooks, multi-sensory learning activities? Frequently accessed information can be at their desk or on the classroom, like multiplication charts. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit with the UDL stuff. Have structure and a predictable routine that helps everyone feel calmer and safe. Make it a point to praise students on things other than reading during reading time. That's a big one for kids with dyslexia or kids that are struggling with reading. You know, Sarah, I love that you're sitting quietly and sharing your book with Lisa. You're doing a nice job, right? <laughs> Judith, um, you had such a great answer when I asked you, um, you know, what you liked about the book, right? I um, Teaching and practicing self-advocacy with all students. That's a huge one. So those student notebooks that I mentioned earlier that my Orton Gillingham students did, um, I actually made a classroom version of those. And so I made a binder with, um, and I have, I have those materials. I, I didn't create them. They're from Teachers Be Teachers, but I don't mind sharing that folder with anyone that wants it. If you went through our Orton Gillingham training with CERC, you already have a copy of it. Um, I think that we need to show that we all need help and nobody should be afraid to ask for it. And so any student should have access to um, anchor charts that remind me how to pronounce a certain word with a phoneme or how to spell a word with a certain phoneme, right? I think any student should be able to just go up, just like in the dictionary, go up and find, oh, you know what? I can't remember um, what's the rule for when you should, like I said, you know, use GE versus DGE, go up and look. It teaches them to be more independent and it teaches them to take more ownership of their learning instead of asking the teacher. And it shows that it's okay if we don't remember the, the answer, right? I don't know that I could remember the answers to all the spelling generalizations right now off the top of my head. I haven't been teaching with Orton Gillingham for a little while and that's okay. It doesn't mean I'm not a good teacher. It just means that there's a lot of rules. And if I don't use them on a regular basis, sometimes you forget them. So these are some further resources that I would love to share with you all. Um, I had put a plug in for the writing revolution. Um, I actually haven't read that book yet, but I've heard amazing things about it from other teachers. And I know you all did a book study on it recently. Um, the Literacy Nest, Emily Gibbons is the kind of teacher I wanna be when I grow up. Um, she, if you can follow her on Facebook. I think she's on Instagram too. She has a blog. Um, she is an Orton Gillingham trained SLP and she has an incredible amount of resources. She's also a fantastic racial equity advocate as well, which is why I really, really like her. Um, I've been trying to get her to come to Connecticut for a long time. Um, oh, already, if you could get her to come to Connecticut, that would be excellent. Be I love fantastic. her too. She's only in yes, Massachusetts, so oh. I didn't want to see. Oh, I didn't she, know she was in Mass. That's great. Mm -hmm. She's actually, right now, she is running um, a literacy conference, a virtual literacy conference yes. that I wasn't able to attend. Um, I did attend it last year. It was phenomenal. Highly, highly recommend it. Um, mm -hmm. But I couldn't, I couldn't swing it this time. Um, All Roads Lead to Reading is um, one that I use frequently on Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, those again are Orton Gillingham materials that can be used for decoding and comprehension, things like that. Um, so Marilyn Zecker, so I'll show you here. I should, you guys can still see, you can see her website now, right? Okay. Um, so the funny thing is, is this website hasn't been updated in a while. So you may find some broken links, but if you Google Marilyn Zucker, you will find more updated stuff. But this was the most updated like home website of hers that I could find. Um, so check out her multi-sensory math here. All right. But she is very well trained in Orton Gillingham. And so she really has that um, she really has some fantastic connections and she does do, she does do trainings, um, paid trainings, but like I said, there are some of her, uh, seminars on YouTube or webinars, I guess you'd call them on YouTube that you can access for free. So I love her. She is really cool. <laughs> um, peachy speechy is another one that I like because one of the questions that we kept getting asked when we were in our virtual trainings was, how am I supposed to do this with a mask on? How am I supposed to have students um, know what sound I'm making, right? If they can't see my mouth. Um, I like Peachy Speechy because she will show the students on a video how to articulate a certain sound. She slows it down and she'll say, you know, and, and I'm not a speech language pathologist, so bear with me because I don't know the correct terms, you know, doing certain things with your tongue or feeling the sound in a certain part of your mouth, right? She's awesome at that. 
so that's what I recommended for, um, for teachers that, you know, and, and like I said, you got to be safe. So um, keeping the masks on, but still allowing them to see how um, a sound is articulated. All right. Um, reading Rocket's article. So um, recently, my colleague and I did a training at Adelbrook, which if you're not familiar with is um, a school that's specifically for students with autism. It's a private school. And we, um, you may have some students with autism in your class. And um, these are two packets that um, are, we found incredibly beneficial in building our training on teaching reading comprehension specifically for students with, um, on, on the autism spectrum disorder. And that is because um, some students uh, who have autism might typically um, lack theory of mind, right? That um, coherence that we, they have the cognitive coherence. Um, they may have difficulty with executive functioning, which are three really big components of reading comprehension. And so those resources, um, if you have students who are like that, I would suggest they're very, very helpful. Um, I also put links down here about integrating social studies into literacy routines, as well as literacy strategies in science. Okay. So These are great, thank you. Yeah, so that is the official end of my presentation. And I realize it's not even 11 o'clock yet, I'm sorry. Um, but what I would like to do, if, if you'll allow me, is I'd like to go back and look more at the UDL guidelines. Um, and the reason I would like to do that, what slide is it? Here it is. So anyone here familiar with UDL guidelines? Little bit, okay. Little so, bit. yeah. So that makes me that makes me feel good because this is something I can teach you guys and not and not bore you. But um, a universal design for learning comes from Cast up here. I would definitely bookmark this website because this is going to be a huge, huge, huge push for the state of Connecticut in the years to come. And the reason it is is because we are focusing on strengthening our Tier One instruction, our core instruction, and we are focusing on closing that opportunity gap and the achievement gap for students. So this is um, a UDL checklist and I can post um, other resources. There's UDL lesson plans and things like that. A universal design for learning has three separate networks in the brain. This is, this is, our, this is our brain science here. The first one is the why of learning. Why do I need to know this information? Why do I care? Why should I be motivated about this? Okay, so I just wanna be really clear about a couple of things. UDL is not a curriculum. It is not a checklist. I am not suggesting that you print these out and check, check, check every time you're planning a lesson. That is not what you should be doing because it doesn't make sense. What I do suggest that you do is when you are planning your lessons, UDL can help you plan for all of the students in your classroom, right? Because UDL is very much about all of these students in our classroom our general education students first, special education, any and any of them with IEPs or 504s, that's their secondary category. Okay, so it promotes a lot of equity that way. So providing, <clears throat> excuse me, providing options for recruiting that interest. Um, my colleague Sneed and I would be more than happy to share with you very, very specific strategies, you know, and concrete examples of each of these. Okay. Um, providing options for sustaining effort and persistence, providing those options for self-regulation, okay? Multiple means of representation. So what are ways of customizing the display of information? So that's like, for example, letting the students decide how big the font they want on their ebook. That's it's as simple as that, right? Or deciding um, if they want to read the book, you know, physically or, or on the ebook. Um, auditory information, visual information, giving students those visual representations of things. Language and symbols. Let's clarify that vocabulary and those symbols. Um, let's clarify the syntax and structure. So going over vocabulary before students read, right? And preparing them to analyze that vocabulary. Options for comprehension. Let's activate or supply our background knowledge. Let's look at those patterns, those critical features, big ideas. Providing multiple means of action and expression. So physical action. So again, structured literacy, one of the biggest components is that it is multi-sensory. And now I want, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to show you guys how integrated they are, right? They're, they're very, very integrated. Um, multiple media for communication, 
multiple tools for construction and composi composition. And if you click on these links, like I said before, you will be seeing specific and concrete examples of these. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, okay? Um, and then executive functioning. I like to focus on this one the most because I've noticed when I was a teacher, that was the one students tended to struggle with the most. Part of that is their age um, because our executive functioning doesn't tend to really set in more until we're in our low 20s, which is why you see college students making the brilliant choices that they do. Um, but another thing is um, students don't necessarily know, for example, okay, I'm reading to myself and, huh, that didn't make sense. Oh, well, just gonna keep reading, right? I see that all the time or they're reading out loud. Oh, that word, has, I don't know what that word is. I must've pronounced that word. Oh, okay, whatever, I'll just keep going, right? So UDL promotes that is that um, having students monitor for their own progress and kind of self-correct, right? One video that I can post in a group, um, I mean, we have time to watch it now, but um, Todd Rose gives a TED talk on um, universal design for learning that is absolutely phenomenal. Um, let me find it here. I think it's Todd. There, I have, can you, um, when, when you've been, you know, at the end of this, Little, um, video or talk or whatever. Can you just go back and say more about how structured literacy and UDL are integrated and supportive yeah, of each other? Because my district is huge into UDL and we have been for many years, and but we're also balanced literacy. So if I can get them to see how the two are very integrated, it might be mm -hmm. easier to make the shift. Sure. So UDL is, so we know structured literacy. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do this, Lisa. I'm going to go back to this component, right? Explicit and emotionally sound. That's two of the components of structured literacy. Let's go to the UDL guidelines here. Emotionally sound, minimizing threats and distractions right there, okay? Um, what was the other one? Um, explicit, right? Here are the salience. In other words, here's the relevance behind our goals and objectives. Um, we want to, um, those expectations and beliefs that, motiv that optimize motivation. So again, we want our students to be engaged in the learning. We want them to understand why they're learning something. A great UDL classroom, I should be able to walk around and ask the students, hey, what are you learning about today? Oh yeah, why? Why is that important, right? That's the biggest thing with UDL. And yeah. I know because my admin used to do that a lot with me. Um, let me go back. It's a systematic and cumulative, right? It builds upon itself, again, there are, these are built in right in. So for example, um, there are patterns, there are critical features, there are big ideas and relationships. We're maximizing their ability to transfer and generalize, right? Because if a student can't, a student, students don't learn, we're, sorry, let me back up. We don't want our kids to learn concepts and skills in silos and never transfer them to the, to the next um, text or to the next activity or whatever. So we, UDL has our kids guide information processing and visualization. It has them say, okay, you have learned this concept here. I want you to now apply it to the next um, activity or next task that we ask you to do. And there's our systematic and cumulative part, right? Because we are building on what we've already been taught. Okay. Excellent. Structured literacy yeah. does that very much, right? Because mm -hmm. again, I, and I mentioned this before, I don't ask you to learn concepts that you're barely going to use before I teach you the ones that are most commonly used. Perfect. It is also very explicit, like I said, because um, we UDL does not, and I've already said this multiple times, does not assume that students come into the room with certain knowledge. And that's my biggest thing. And I think that um, for our students that um, have experienced poverty, for our students that have those, and I, let, and I call them opportunity gaps for a reason, because am I achieving at a lower rate because I don't know what a yacht is? Or is it because I don't have the privilege of knowing what a yacht is? I think there's a big difference there. Mm -hmm. And so UDL does not assume that our students have certain knowledge, okay? Yep. So we teach all students, with the UDL. Now, the most typical response I get from participants when we train on this is, well, I don't want to, I don't want to give them um, tools that they're going to use because then it makes it too easy. So for example, that multiplication chart on the desk, right? Yeah. yeah. I have a couple of questions. First of all, what is the learning goal? 
let's think about that for a second. So the learning goal, let's say, is um, to be able to solve a um, multi-step word problem. It's not to know my times tables, all right? So UDL is very clear on our goals. We are flexible on our means, all right? So that means that, so we, I am very, very specific. That's the biggest thing with UDL. I'm very specific with my goals, right? Because in a multi-step word problem, in the, in the common core standard, it does not ask me to know my times tables. So no, I'm not making it too easy for those students. What I'm doing is I'm providing them with information that they need to know in order to solve the multiplication, excuse me, the word problem. Another thing I also tell teachers is the students that need these accommodations will use them. The students that don't, they'll play with them for a little bit, it's a novelty. Then they get bored because they realize they can do the task faster without it. Some of our students need to look up, oh, what is four times five, right? With that little chart most times until they get it. The other kids, if they know it instantaneously, they're not gonna waste their time doing that at first, right? And then it removes a really, really big stigma that I used to deal with in, in eighth grade because I taught eighth grade for four years is why does he get a calculator and I don't, right? And can I respond with, oh, well, because it says that on his IEP and you don't have one. No, I can't say that, right? I used to say my go-to line used to be, everybody gets what they need in order to be successful. That's what I used to say. And it was my very polite way of saying, mind your own business. But um, that's, not, that's not very helpful because some of my students in my classroom probably could have really benefited from using a calculator for certain things because they knew how to do you know, the two-step algebra problem, but they were struggling with the calculation piece. Again, if the common core standard is not asking me to demonstrate that the students know how to calculate, it's demonstrating that the students know how to apply. Those are two different math skills. So common core standards tell us the what, they do not usually tell us the how. Let's think about another example. So the, another example might be um, writing, okay? Because that's a big one. How many of your kids, could just blast out a paragraph right there, handwritten or typed without fighting you? <laughs> How many of your kids could tell you about the topic verbally? How many of your kids maybe could draw a picture? How many of your kids could create a diagram or a presentation or a podcast? UDL promotes multiple means of representation and action expression. In other words, Students are allowed to look at the, um, it's 4.1, so it's in the upper right-hand corner here, vary the methods for response and navigation. So students can show me different ways that I understand that they, that sorry, students can show me different ways that they understand the information. And now, now the response that I tend to get is, well, but how do I grade this? Okay, there's an answer for that too, so don't worry. So UDL, make sure that you have a very strong rubric. That is the biggest thing that we need if we're going to be able to assess our students appropriately. So if we know that our students can demonstrate, now I, um, I could actually find it if you want me to, give me, I, 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 can, I can find it if you want. Um, Smeet and I have a training that we do um, about the pioneer life. Give me one second, if you don't mind. So here's my rubric. You guys see this? Okay. So we show, um, and I can show you the slide too. I don't mind showing you. Here's an exemplar. If I ask a student um, to tell me about pioneer life, right, in the Oregon, going to the Oregon Trail, you know, and, the, and this is the exemplar, this is all the information I'm looking for for a student. None of this on the rubric is um, restricted as to how the student, and I, and I realize this isn't a great rubric, I threw it together in about two minutes. I know that you guys would do much better for your students, but um, none of this here should restrict how my students express their knowledge, okay? So my students shouldn't have to write a five paragraph essay if that's not what the standard is asking me for. Let's look at the standards. Let's do the ELA instead because I think ELA is, I want to do writing. 
I want, let's do grade eight because that's the grade I'm most familiar with. Okay. So for example, introduce claims, acknowledge and distinguish the claims from alternate or opposing claims and organize the reasons and evidence logically. Where in this does it say that they have to write a, a five paragraph essay? I don't see it. It says write arguments, but do you always have your students handwrite? Are we that restrictive or do we let them type? Right? Can we have them craft an argument using um, a podcast? Can they craft it using um, diagrams? Can they talk about, you know, so for example, can I have a student fill out a Venn diagram graphic organizer, introduce those claims and talk about how they are um, similar and different from each other? Can I organize that, those reasons and evidence logically? If a student could do all that, but they didn't write a five paragraph essay, some teachers might fail them on this standard because the student refused to pick up a pencil and write the essay. But if I have a student that has been able to do this, they can fill out that Venn diagram and give me a great argument and, get, and explain to me exactly why um, those claims are um, you know, opposing each other and why they're not, and here's how, what I agree with, and here's the evidence why, right? Shouldn't that be enough? Isn't that showing me that they've met that standard? And that's, so that's what I tend to see is I tend to see clear goals, but then I also tend to see inflexible means. And with UDL, it's all about clear goals and flexible means. Having a strong rubric will allow you to grade different pieces of assignments or different ways that students submit their assignments without being concerned about, oh, you, you know, am I grading this appropriately? Am I really showing mastery or not or progress, progress towards mastery? Because look at all this here, none of this, nowhere does it say a student has to pick up a pen and write or has to open up a Word document and start typing. I'll say it again, the common core standards tell us what, they do not tell us how, okay? Use words, phrases, and clauses to create cohesion and clarify the relationships among claims, counterclaims, reasons, and evidence, okay. Can I have two kids? Like I said, I, I just, I like the podcast idea because I heard a great one. Um, a few weeks ago with, with two 12-year-olds um, doing it. And I thought it was phenomenal. They were talking about um, water conservation. They did a great job. They would have met all these standards, no problem. But they didn't, not to my knowledge, they didn't. They never opened up a Word document and started typing, okay? And so I just wanna be really clear that I think that sometimes common core standards are interpreted as much more rigid than they really are, okay? The UDL guidelines uh, website is so, so full. I couldn't possibly show you all of this um, at once, but there are a number of resources that I can, I'm more than happy to share with you all. Um, where is it? I just wanna make sure I've got the one. This is a training and I don't mind sharing this with you because it's free to any um, district. So it's, it's okay that I'm sharing this. Um, where is it? I can share these uh, documents with, with Lisa if you want. You can share the link out. That sounds so this, great. Yeah. So UDI, UDL barrier flowchart. Let me show this. It's bigger. And this is all free information. Do the students care? Are they motivated to learn? So this helps me figure out which, um, which network I'm looking at here. Yeah, they're motivated to learn. Okay. Well, do the students understand the concept? Yeah. No, they're good. Is the student able to show their understanding in the teacher-specified way? Well, no, not all of my students are able to write that five paragraph essay. All right, let's look down here at providing multiple means of action and expression. So I, I love flowcharts because I feel like they help me pinpoint what I need to look for. Right here, this is what I was talking about with the very concrete examples. Do I have to do this as a blank, as a paper, for example? Students don't, then these are some of these symptoms you might see when you are not seeing engagement in your classroom. Whenever you're starting to teach something new, okay, guys, we're gonna learn about, I don't know, how the glucose cycle works. Oh, we don't wanna do that, right? <laughs> I know you've never heard that in your classroom. Right here, providing options for rewarding, uh, excuse me, for recruiting interest. Here are some more disengagement symptoms. What are we working on again? What are we supposed to be doing, right? This is too hard, this is too easy. Um, and then other disengagement systems. This is another one that Smita and I focus on quite a bit. What was my grade? Let's talk about that for a moment. 
How many of you guys provide rubrics to your students before they begin a task that are reachable for them, that they can understand it themselves? And they can say, okay, here's my work, here's the rubric. I know what grade I should be expecting based on what, what I did to it. How many of you guys do that? Okay. So with UDL, you have a teacher rubric that is student friendly as well. So the students should be able to look at the rubric and know what grade that they're going to expect based on that. Grading should not be a surprise, right? Because too often, and this was true for me as a student, I would turn something in, I'd work so hard on it, but I hadn't, especially in elementary school, I tend to see that it's not typical for students to have ever seen a rubric before. In fact, I don't know that I saw rubrics until I was in high school personally. And I, and I went to a private school, so that may have been different. But I think that it is really important for students of all ages to see exemplars of what great work looks like, you know, exceed, however you use your point system, you know, maybe, maybe you have exceeds expectations and meets expectations and however you want to do it. I don't know how many students have ever seen work like that before, where they can look at, here's an exemplar, here's you know, a paper or, or a project or whatever that exceeds expectations because it does this, 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 and this. And here's one that meets expectation. Doesn't go above and beyond, but it meets expectations. Or I don't know how many students have seen that. And I think that's something that is incredibly important because then the students, it's promoting their independence and autonomy, and it's promoting engagement and ownership in their own work because they should be going back to look at the rubric and knowing um, how their work matches up to the exemplars that you've given them. Here are the representation barriers, right? I should not be teaching my students in only one or two simil similarly styled ways. Students should be able to access information in many different ways. So if, you're, if they're doing math and they're doing a worksheet, I hope that they're also having manipulatives that they can play with, right? Or that they're drawing or that they're you know, drawing pictures, whatever. Again, the kids that need it will use it. The kids that don't need it, won't, they won't use it, right? UDL is like a menu. You don't go into a restaurant and order everything on the menu, unless you're starving. You order what you want and what you're feeling that you would like that day. It's going to be different for every single student. Having UDL tools in your classroom or having UDL design for your classroom, I should say, is a way that every student has a menu of options. They can pick and choose the accommodations that they want to use that day. And they get to, they get to decide what works for them. They get to know more about themselves as a learner. You get to know more about them as a learner because you know that, you know, Alyssa prefers um, information in a visual way and um, Sarah prefers in an auditory way, but they're both going to master that, that um, strand, that CCSS, and they're both going to show it in very different ways because Sarah is going to um, write a song about it. And she's going to write a catchy little jingle about how to do this math formula. And Alyssa is going to show me a really cool diagram about it. And both of them have mastered that information because they can both apply it to um, many different problems. Removing action and expression barriers. So again, I will provide you all with this with these um, documents. I have no problem with that. And again, um, so through um, CSDE, CERC is um, allowed to provide free training for this, for UDL, um, we can provide up to four days of training. And my favorite part of it is it actually can include a half day for parents, which is really, really fun. Um, does it have to be up to four days of training? No, it can be a half day, it can be a full day, it can be whatever you want. We can personalize it for your districts um, or your school. Um, and we will, Smita and I, I think, um, we do a really great job of trying to determine exactly what checkpoints you, you all would like to work on or what barriers you're explicitly seeing in your students, things like that. And we try really hard to personalize it. We don't just do the same presentation over and over again. It can be virtual in person. It can be 90 minutes or three hours. It's really, um, we provide a menu. <laughs> um, so again, having these options for expression and communication, that physical action and executive functioning, right? So. Let's look at, for example, um, right here, this is what I was talking about and I should have shown this. Show uh, 6.1, show the students the rubric or expectations 
and allow them to set their own goals and teacher specified parameters. So some students, you know, does every student um, have the motivation to go to exceed your expectations? Not necessarily. Some students may not want to put in that extra effort. And so they'll say, okay, I wanna make sure that my project meets the expectations and I'm fine with that. Some students want to um, show that they can exceed your expectations. And so they're going to put in that extra work and do those extra few things to really show that, okay? I wanna be clear about a few other things. If you go through this, you are likely doing a lot of the things on these checklists already because a lot of this is just good teaching and best practices. So I don't want you to think to yourself, oh my God, I have to learn an entirely new way of teaching. You don't, I promise. <laughs> um, what we recommend is we recommend looking at this flow chart and looking at some of the barriers that you typically see within your students. And it can be by subject, if you teach different subjects as a general ed teacher or, or a special ed teacher, or if you teach one specific subject, that's fine too. I recommend looking at a couple of barriers and focusing on just a few of these checkpoints, no more, because you're gonna overwhelm yourself if you, if, you, if you don't. And again, I do recommend going through and thinking about, oh, I already do that, right? I already find ways for um, my students to revise their papers before they hand them in. Okay, great, so I already do that. So I wanna show you some of the other ones. So these are more detailed. These are, um, make it a little bigger so y'all can see. They're just um, making sure we're um, cognizant of the time. So we, it's, we're yes. at 1117. So yeah. I do wanna give people time to chat oh, and sure. ask questions about structured Please. literacy as well. I do love what you're presenting, but I, I wanna be aware of people's time too. No, please go right ahead. I, okay. I told you I get excited about this stuff. So I will talk. <laughs> no, this is great. This is great, thank you. So. Um, if you want to stop your share and then we can just go back mm -hmm. into the gallery view and see everyone and perhaps people can, um, you know, unmute yourself, please. Oh, we had no, we had some late arrivals. So thank you for coming. And if you um, have any questions on uh, what Claire has talked about up to this point, please feel free to unmute and ask. Don't all ask at one time. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna drop a link into the chat, but I'll provide it. Um, I can put it in my presentation so that you'll have the link for it. Todd Rose, um, it's called The Myth of Average, and it's about 20 minutes. And um, basically he talks about, and he is an educator, he talks about um, the origin of uh, adjustable car seats. Okay, yeah. because <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but um, he talks about how, in World War II, they were having difficulty because they had these, um, you know, seats in um, the pilot cockpits. Not everybody could fit in those, right? Some people's legs were too long, some people's legs were too short, some people bumped up like this, right? And so the US military, instead of accepting it, said, well, guess what? We're not buying any more planes until you fit our needs. And think about how many millions of dollars are spent in the military, right? And that was a very drastic move for them. And so that, that is where the origin of adjustable seats came from because they realized at first they thought, okay, well, let's design, let's take measurements of thousands of thousands of our pilots, you know, shoulder width and, and weight and height and, you know, hip width and all that nice stuff. Let's do that. We'll find the average and we'll design the seat that fits that average pilot. Guess how many people it fit? And it's the same thing with our lesson plan because we're trying to design for the average student when there's no such thing. Yeah. There's no such thing as a That's student it. who has, you know, high achievement across every single area. There's no such thing as a student who has low achievement across every single area. Every single student has what he calls a jagged learning profile. Mm. Well, and so that's why he talks about UDL. Well, it's, it's always those strengths and weaknesses of every student. Every single, because aren't, isn't that what a human being is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Let me great drop analogy. that link in the chat, um, but I'll put it in my, uh, in my presentation so that when I send it to Lisa, um, that it's, it's in there. Perfect. Why are you not doing this for me? Come on. Copy. So that's a really fun, it's about 20 minutes, but it is a very Perfect. inspiring.
TED Talks, one of my favorites. Thank you very much. That's perfect. Yeah. Claire, so, I, yeah. What other questions or thoughts do you have for me, if anything? I know it's a small group. I, get, I would like to share some thoughts. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I thought this was excellent. I love how, even though I feel like I know a lot, there's always so something to learn and reinforce. And of course, at full disclosure, I'm friends with Sarah and Lisa and <laughs> we've known each other for a while. Um, I am currently embarking, I'm a literacy coach in my district um, and we are revising our own curriculum and making the shifts to structured literacy from balanced literacy. And I really appreciate your emphasis on the, um, the emotional part of this, not just for uh, students having our instruction be emotionally sound, but the transition for our teachers. And so mm -hmm. I tried to do a lot of work with that, like making the connections to, to what they know, to what is new. Um, and we're constantly up against those, um, you know, the pendulum swing comments and all this other stuff. I know you guys deal with that in, in your lives constantly, but I do appreciate that. And I love that you are working so hard to make these trainings free. Um, yeah. Sometimes I feel like with your, the, the UDL, what I want, I guess this is my question. Um, no one in my district has mentioned this yet. Uh, we know about it, but you're saying this is gonna be a big emphasis from the state coming up along with the dyslexia legislation that has passed. Yeah. I am wondering what should I do to make sure that my curriculum coordinators are aware of this, even though I'm just the literacy coach, like where can I direct them to or just, like any suggestions for like, sometimes I feel like my learning is faster than the people at the top. Sure, yeah. Do you, do you mind if I ask you what district you're in? I'm in regional school district 17. It's Haddam, Higginham and Killingworth. We're a pretty okay. small district, but. Okay, so the reason I was asking is because um, right now CERC is working on um, districts that have um, disproportionalities and they're labeled those turnaround schools and I don't believe you're one of them. Um, so if you are in one of those districts or schools, then you will be seeing us um, or my colleagues, but um, there are a couple of things that I can do. I can send you those guidance documents, Judith, um, the ones that I was discussing, um, adapted, achieve, advance, I think is, is how um, they put it. Um, those are all very much built into um, the guidance documents that CS CSDE is, um, is releasing. Because again, we know that our students are coming back to school with extremely varying levels of ability and needs and everything, even more so than they would have before COVID, right? And one way that we can meet all of their needs is by strengthening our tier one curriculum and making sure, and our, not only our curriculum, but our curricular approaches, our instructional approaches, I should say, right? Because we need to remember, we are, as if we are a general art teacher, we are responsible for every student in that classroom because sometimes the attitude I get from some general ed teachers when I was a special ed teacher is, well, those four kids are yours. They're not mm -hmm. mine, they're yours. I saw that all the time. And what I want to really emphasize, and I know that CSDE emphasizes this as well, is that all students are general education students first, first. and then they have special needs. And that is how we meet their needs. We meet their needs, strengthening our tier one curriculum and instructional approaches through those UDL guidelines. Claire, will you be working with New Haven? Uh, somebody will, I don't know if it's me. But somebody is working with New Haven on UDL. Somebody is, or are you I'm asking? Ask, sorry, I'm asking you. Somebody will be working with New Haven on UDL. Oh, okay. So is uh, New Haven's one of our turnaround districts, right? I'm sure. I think, they, I think they are. So um, the answer is yes, but I need that's still in the works. And so I don't know what the plan is yet. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. Because that I'm thinking this could be an interesting way in with structured literacy. Um, if we have, you, you know, if UDL becomes something that we're doing, um, like Judy was saying, you know, tying those, or Lisa was saying, sorry, tying those two together could be an interesting mm -hmm. way in. Yeah. Yeah. That is something that I push when I do my, when we do our UDL trainings or our HE trainings is that I, is that I talk about how structured literacy fits right into that very nicely. Mm -hmm. So the focus for CSD this year is on UDL, but yes. last, the last, is it still mastery equity and SEL? Are those the three big goals as well? 
Yes, but those are part, those, if you, if those you are the UDL guidelines, guidelines goals, those are yeah. very much intertwined. Yeah. yeah. Inter okay. Because yeah. we believe that UDL promotes equity. All of those things. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could ask, please, I, I feel like I'm, I of course haven't had much communication with the teachers over the summer, but, um, if I am in fact, one of the few that are getting interested in the um, science of reading and structured literacy, how could I have a first step? What kind of a first step could I have to my district to, um, to introduce the subject? Great question. Alyssa, what do you teach? Uh, kindergarten. Kindergarten. Okay. So um, I don't, if anybody else wants to jump in, they can. For me, Alyssa, um, you are more than welcome to sign up for one of our statewide trainings that um, the registration is not available yet, but I will post when it is. Um, CERC runs um, trainings on Orton-Gillingham, which is a structured literacy approach. Um, Wilson reading system. We do both the introductory workshop and the Just Words launch. And then we also, um, this year we're doing three different workshops from Linda Mood Bell, which are Seeing Stars, Lips, and uh, visualizing and verbalizing. Those are all um, free for participants to attend. How after, however, um, you do have to purchase your own materials. Um, some teachers have them already in their district and so they borrow them from others, which is fine. Um, and I can give you more information on that if you're interested and whatever, but um, those are some trainings that we offer if you're interested in being trained in any of those approaches. Um, I don't know, does anybody have other thoughts on what Alyssa could do. I just have a thought because I'm a <clears throat> reading um, intervention teacher in New Haven. And this past year, you know, our every year, but this past year um, in first grade, I had a great, there was a great team and we were analyzing the scores and noticing like, wow, things are, are not looking good. And one of the things we noticed through our dibbles, because um, even though New Haven's a balanced literacy district, we do did give dibbles because it's required by the state is that our um, scores on the um, PSF, the phonemic awareness were, were particularly low. And so we came up with just a quick five, 10 minute plan to work on that each day and saw pretty much immediate results because we were teaching it really directly, systematically, but, 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 and the amount of kids that went from basic to proficient was like outrageously high. And so I think like, maybe looking at that data and just picking one little thing that doesn't take a lot so that people don't feel like, oh my God, I have to change everything. Everything's wrong, you know? Hey, let's see if this helps. Let's yeah. try this. And then when that works, when that worked, people were like, oh, what are we doing next? They were like excited <laughs> because they saw yeah. the impact of what they were doing. Yeah, that's great. Leading yeah. with data is always a good idea. I think we're moving in that direction this year. Um, I'm in Sterling, which is a very small district. We have a pre-K through eight school and we have probably about 300 students. Um, I have always used foundations. It wasn't, um, it wasn't school wide, but I had experienced it in um, my student teaching. So when I came into the school and I saw these kits up in the storeroom that nobody had ever used, I pulled them right down. And I worked with foundations and I've been doing that. This will be my 13th year. Awesome. So um, this is the first year uh, we had some new teachers come in for first grade that were interested in foundations. So we're implementing oh, foundations in first and second grade into, in addition to uh, kindergarten. So I think we're really on the right track with that. I've, al I've also um, purchased Hegarty, which I'm going to use Excellent. in my kindergarten classroom. Yeah. I Good. really want to boost that PA. Um, we've always known the importance of it, but Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to be my job in my school this year to really push things and share Good. what I've been reading. So um, I appreciate the suggestions. Thank you. That was awesome. Really exciting. Yeah. And I also think with doing Hegarty, if you keep your own data and you share that with people, because you're going to mm -hmm. have great results, they're going to be like, Ooh, okay, well, I'll try it. Sure. I'll try it. Why not? You know? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Good. Plan. That was Thank what you. happened. Yep. We had that same thing happen at my school when we brought Hegarty. Okay. We saw huge results. So people were very excited about that. That's so great. Any other thoughts, comments, questions that you'd like to share before we end? Because we're just at 1130 now. Yeah, so the, the biggest sure. difference I would say between like Hegarty and Orton-Gillingham is Hegarty is based on Orton-Gillingham. 
So just, just so you know, so Orton Gillingham is not a curriculum. You can't go purchase as, as far as I know, you can't go purchase a curriculum that is like Orton Gillingham, you know, grades one to two or whatever. So Hegarty is a specific curriculum as is Wilson, as is um, Linda Mood Bell. Orton Gillingham is only an approach to teaching reading, um, but it is the original one. It was Samuel Orton and Anna Gillingham were the ones that dis that coined the term dyslexia. And and at first, uh, well, it was over a hundred years ago at this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and designed an instructional approach for students with dyslexia as mm -hmm. or students who are struggling with reading. So they're the OG OGs basically. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would definitely be interested in that, uh, that training through mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Oh, it's, it's really good. Anything that builds your knowledge, right? So you wanna build mm -hmm. your own knowledge base first and then mm -hmm. you can apply the strategy, the curriculum to that, you know? Thank you. Yeah, this was great, thank you. Thanks everyone for coming today. Go enjoy the rest of your Saturday and your weekend. And please remember to come to our sound walls presentation on the 10th. If you haven't already signed up, that's at night. And um, mm. we have a couple more fun presentations this summer. So enjoy and thanks so much. Invite your friends, invite your colleagues to join our group. <laughs> Bye everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.